in that place where they tore the nightshade and blackberry patches from their roots to make room for the Medallion City golf course. There once, there once, there once was a neighborhood. He felt only the bite of a nail in his boot, which pierced the ball of his foot whenever he came down on it. I waited for Sula to look up at me any minute and say one of those lovely college words like aesthetic or rapport, which I never understood, but which I love because they sounded so comfortable and firm. A Toni Morrison comes along once every, you know, 200 years. The fantastic beauty of her work is that she does uh, give us um, a lyrical equation, you know, to measure our lives by. Winner of the 1993 Nobel Prize in Literature, Toni Morrison is the author of a prodigious body of work, including 10 novels, children's books, nonfiction books, essays, plays, and librettos. Her numerous awards include the Pulitzer Prize in 1988 for Beloved, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2012. In the dedication to her sons in the novel Sula, she writes, it is sheer good fortune to miss somebody long before they leave you. This documentary, Sheer Good Fortune, provides excerpts of the tribute to Toni Morrison's literary legacy held at Virginia Tech and hosted by Nikki Giovanni, Maya Angelou, and Joanne Gabin. Writers, artists, and scholars read passages from Morrison's work and speak about how her writings have affected their lives, their teaching, and their own creative imagination. I am a, a great respecter and love of Toni Morrison. At the time, I read Sula. And I was so moved and entranced, enchanted, and strengthened by that book that in the midst of my misery, I wrote a letter to Toni Morrison. We hadn't even met at the time, but I wrote a letter to her to say thank you. Thank you very much for not only seeing me and naming me somebody else, that's all right. But seeing me as an African-American woman, seeing me and loving me. This is what this woman has done through 10 books. Loving, respecting, appreciating the African-American woman and all that she goes through. Whether it's in Beloved, The Bluest Eye, whatever it is. So I, I love the fact that I'm here tonight to be here to respect. I show my respect and my delight, my love for Toni Morrison. I thank you for your genius. I'm going to be reading from Song of Solomon. And it's a passage, a very descriptive passage, which is about uh, the Great Lake region and what, what it smelled like at that time to live in this overly industrialized part of the country and, and what that smell was like at night and how it takes everybody into a space where they can both dream and at the same time ache. And, I, and I'm, I'm using that because, uh, first of all, because of it spoke to me coming from there. I, I know the smell, I know that, that feeling and also the bravery it took to describe something that isn't particularly pretty and it isn't exotic in any kind of way. On autumn nights, in some parts of the city, the wind from the lake brings a sweetish smell to shore, an odor like crystallized ginger or sweet iced tea with a dark clove floating in it. 
There is no explanation for the smell either, since the lake on September 19, 1963, was so full of mill refuse and the chemical wastes of a plastics manufacturer that the hair of the willows that stood near the shore was thin and pale. I'd like to read a passage from the end of Toni Morrison's Jazz. I envy them their public love. I myself have only known it in secret, shared it in secret and longed, oh, longed to show it, to be able to say out loud what they have no need to say at all. That I have loved only you, surrendered my whole self reckless to you and nobody else. That I want you to love me back and show it to me. That I love the way you hold me, how close you let me be to you. I like your fingers on and on, lifting, turning. I have watched your face for a long time now and missed your eyes when you went away from me. Talking to you and hearing you answer, that's the kick. But I can't say that out loud. I can't tell anyone that I have been waiting for this all my life and that being chosen to wait is the reason I can. Toni Morrison might deny that there's anything uh, of herself in that passage, that it's simply the book speaking to the reader, but I think it is the writer also. Uh, that's how it speaks to me. I'm going to read from Sula. They thought of their son newly killed and remembered his legs in short pants and wondered where the bullet had gone in. Or they remembered how dirty the room looked when their father left home and wondered if that is the way the slim young Jew felt, he who for them was both son and lover and in whose downy face they could see the sugar and butter sandwiches and feel the oldest and most devastating pain there is, not the pain of childhood, but the remembrance of it. Wow, that, that, is, that is exactly where this great writing is, that it's the remembrance. That's where it is. That, and it's not the remembrance for me. This is the amazing thing, and I hope I can describe it. It's not remembrance of an event. An event. That isn't the remembrance that she's talking about. She's the, talking about the remembrance of the body and the mind and the soul and the e emotions in space, in time, there. I'm reading the last two paragraphs of uh, Sister Tony's Bluest Die. We tried to see her without looking at her and never, never went near not because she was absurd or repulsive or because we were frightened, but because we had failed her. Our flowers, our flowers never grew. I was convinced that Frida was right, that I had planted them too deeply. How could I have been so slovenly? So we avoided Piccola breed love forever. From Tar Baby. Hurry, hurry, she urged him. They are waiting. Waiting? Who's waiting? Suddenly he was alarmed. The men, the men are waiting for you. She was pulling the oars now, moving out. You can choose now. You can get free of her. They are waiting in the hills for you. They are naked and they are blind too. I have seen them. Their eyes have no color in them, but they gallop 
They race, these horses, like angels all over the hills where the rainforest is, where the champion daisies trees still grow. Go there, go there, choose them. From The Bluest Eye. I'm gonna read the opening of The Bluest Eye. Uh, and the reason I'm reading that is there's a passage where you hear the main character talking about how whenever she would get sick, or whenever any of the kids in the family would get sick, the older people look at them like, how dare you? <laughs> we don't have time for you to be sick. And I remember that feeling when I was growing up. It's like people like, you know, put a shirt on. Or if you, know, if you sneeze or if you're walking around barefoot in the house, it's like, what are you doing? You're going to get sick. <laughs> like, as if it's your fault when you get sick. You know, people, all the while that they're taking care of you. If we cut or bruise ourselves, they ask, are we crazy? When we catch colds, they shake their heads in disgust at our lack of consideration how they ask us do you expect anybody to get anything done if you all are sick my mother comes her hands are large and rough and when she rubs the vix salve on my chest i am rigid with pain i am covered up with heavy quilts and ordered to sweat, <laughs> which I do <laughs> promptly. So when I think of autumn, I think of somebody with hands who does not want me to die. I'll be reading from Sula. 1937, when she returns to the bottom. What was taken by outsiders to be slackness, slovenliness, or even generosity was in fact a full recognition of the legitimacy of forces other than good ones. They did not believe doctors could heal. For them, none ever had done so. They did not believe death was accidental. Life might be, but death was deliberate. They did not believe nature was ever askew, only inconvenient. Plague and drought were as normal as springtime. From the bluest eye. These particular brown girls from Mobile and Aked are not like some of their sisters. They're not fretful, nervous, or shrill. They do not have lovely black decks that stretch as though against an invisible collar. Their eyes do not bite. These sugar brown Mobile girls move through the streets without a stir. They are sweet. They are as sweet and plain as butter cake. Slim ankles, long, narrow feet. They wash themselves with orange-colored Life Boy soap, dust themselves with cashmere bouquet talc, clean their teeth with salt on a piece of rag, soften their skins with Jergens lotion. They smell like wood, newspaper, and vanilla. They straighten their hair with Dixie peach and part it on the side. At night, they curl it in paper from brown bags tie a print scarf around their heads, and sleep with hands folded across their stomachs. They do not drink, smoke, or swear, and they still call sex nookie. <laughs> she understands music through language, you know. And for singers, I mean, if they're really on to being what I call singers, who understand that singing is just as much acting as not, then you're telling a story. So she knows how to tell stories, yeah. From Song of Solomon. She said she wanted her work to 
impact somebody like hearing a black sermon. And ultimately, um, when you've read Toni Morrison, you know, you get that spirit. You got a home too. Uh, grab it. Uh, take it. Uh, hold it. Uh, my brothers, uh, make it. Uh, my brothers, shake it. Uh, squeeze it. Uh, turn it. Uh, twist it. Uh, beat it. Uh, kick it. Uh, kiss it. Uh, whip it. Uh, stomp it. Uh, dig it. Uh, plow it. Uh, seed it. Uh, Reap it, rent it, buy it, sell it, own it, build it, multiply it, and pass it on. Can you hear me? Pass it on. It's a, a deep honor for me to be here, um, to even be considered a person worthy of sharing the stage with all of these people. And I <laughs> told my mother backstage that I believe this happened because I've been asking God since I was 19 to be able to sing this song in front of Toni Morrison. <laughs> So I'm in college and I got the bluest eye and I read the bluest eye and I understood it better. Like I was able to like comprehend reading better. And when I closed the last page, I'm not saying anything anybody doesn't know, but you know how Toni Morrison's writing is like a long poem. The whole book is like a long poem, her, her, her rhythm. So I closed the book. And this song totally just came out. I just thought, I want to sing this song <laughs> for her someday. This is called Not Afraid of the Dark. Show me the way and I'll follow. No matter how far, deep, dark, or hollow, cause when I'm with you, I'm not afraid of the dark. This is a place that I've never known, but through the keyhole I smell a sweet aroma. Unlock the door and I'll gladly go. I'm not afraid of the dark. I'm ready to jump right in. Life is either sink or swim. And I can't pass the chance to know you. And if we get the notion to jump into love's ocean, I want to let you know I'm not afraid of the dark I'm not afraid of the dark Just take my hand and I'll guide you Around the obstacles, nothing's gonna hurt you. Cause when I'm with you, I'm not afraid of the dark. Show me the way and I'll follow. No matter how far, deep, dark, or hollow. Cause when I'm with you, Cause when I'm with you, cause when I'm with you, I'm not afraid 
of the dark. Thank you. I'm going to read something from Paradise. I open up Paradise, and for some reason, I turn to a section of Paradise where uh, the brother is talking about love. What is love? You know, and I thought I would read that section. Let me tell you about love. That silly word you believe is about whether you like somebody or whether somebody likes you, or whether you can put up with somebody in order to get something or some place you want, or you believe it has to do with how your body responds to another body, like robins or bison, or maybe you believe love is how forces of nature or luck is benign to you in particular, not maiming or killing you, but if doing so, it for your own good. Do da 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 love. Do da 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 do da he love 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 love. No da do da di do da love 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 love. Do da da love 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 love. Love is none of that. There is nothing in nature like it. Not in robins or bison or in the banging tails of your hunting dogs and not in blossoms or suckling foal. Love is divine only and difficult always. If you think it is easy, you are a fool. If you think it is natural, you are blind. It has a learned application without reason or motive except that it is God. God, 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 God. Jadine could not find her tongue. She was staring into the mirror at his hair. Last night, sitting with Valerian in the soft light of the dining room, it had looked merely long and unkempt. Here, alone in her bedroom, where there were no shadows, only the glimmering, unrelieved sunlight, his hair looked overpowering, physically overpowering, like bundles of long whips or lashes that could grab her and beat her to jelly and wood, wild, aggressive, vicious hair that needed to be put in jail. <laughs> Uncivilized, reform school hair, Mau Mau, Attica, chain gang hair. From home, Frank left the diner pausing suddenly when he heard a trumpet screech. If anything could match his mood, it was that sound. He preferred bebop to blues. After Hiroshima, musicians understood as early as anyone that Truman's bomb changed everything and only scat and bebop could say how. Inside the room, small and thick with smoke, a dozen or so people faced a trio. Pilgrim of sorrow, I'm out here in this wide world alone. I have no hope for tomorrow, but I'm striving to make heaven my home. The tub was the newest feature in the tiny shotgun house, and Milkman sank gratefully into the steaming water. Sweet brought him soap and a boar's bristle brush and knelt to bathe him. 
what she did for his sore feet, his cut face, his back, his neck, his thighs, and the palms of his hands was so delicious. He couldn't imagine that the lovemaking to follow would be anything but anticlimactic. <laughs> Afterward, he offered to bathe her. She said he couldn't because the tank was small and there wasn't enough water for another hot bath. We played by the creek. I was there in the water in the quiet time. We played. The clouds were noisy and in the way when I needed you, you came to be with me. I, I needed her face to smile. I could only hear breathing. The breathing is gone. Only the teeth are left. She said, you wouldn't hurt me. You, she hurt me. I will protect you. I want her face. Don't love her too much. I, I'm loving her too much. Watch out for her. She can give you dreams. She chews and swallows. Don't fall asleep with her braids, your hair. When she braids your hair, she is the laugh. I am the laughter. I watch the house. I watch the yard. She left me. Daddy is coming for us. A hot thing. Beloved, you are my sister. You are my daughter. You are my face. You are me. I have found you again. You have come back to me. You are my beloved. You are mine. You are mine. You are mine. See, laughed and spread jam on another biscuit. See what I mean? Look to yourself. You free. Nothing and nobody is obliged to save you but you. Seed your own land. You young and a woman, and there's serious limitations in both but you a person too. Don't let Lenore or some trifling boyfriend and certainly no devil doctor decide who you are. That's slavery. Somewhere inside you is that free person I'm talking about. Locate her and let her do some good in the world. See, put her finger in the blackberry jar. She licked it. I ain't going nowhere, Miss Ethel. This is where I belong. Well, I just think that that passage kind of encapsulates the whole essence of what um, Morrison was trying to get at in this novel called Home. It's about um, freedom. It's about personal freedom. There is a subtext of, you know, um, signifying on slavery and the legacy of slavery and also signifying on the fact that, you know, you belong to the land, this is your land. You know, your, your legacy has uh, built up this, this, this society, this culture, this world. I think it really speaks to today, and it's an, it's an empowering kind of statement. And she says, I'm not going anywhere. I belong here. This is my home. Desdemona. Barbary, Barbary, come closer. How I have missed you. Remember the days we spent by the canal? We ate sweets, and you saved the honey for me, eating none yourself. We shared so much. We shared nothing. What do you mean? I mean you don't even know my name. Barbary? Barbary is what you call Africa. Barbary is the geographer, geography of the foreigner the savage. Barbary equals the sly, vicious enemy who must be put down at any price, held down at any cost for the conqueror's pleasure. Barbary is the name of those without whom you could neither live nor prosper. So tell me, what is your name? Saran. Well, Saran, whatever your name, you were my best friend. I was your slave. She has people who love her. And it's time that we gathered, that we circled these wagons and, and put some love around her, just to let her know. Instead of a big house. Instead of a big house. And a great big car. And a great big car. Instead of long trips. Instead of long trips. Shorter. 
Porter. And a clean white boat. And a clean white boat. No. Instead of picnics. Instead of picnics. No. And fishing. And fishing. No. And being all together on a porch. And being all together on a porch. No. This is for you, girl. Oh, this yes. is for you, girl. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This. 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 this is for you. This is for you. I think, I really think this is, yeah, I think it is the first time I've been rendered speechless. <laughs> this is an extraordinary event, but let me tell you, if nothing ever again happens in a crowd for me, it doesn't matter. <laughs> now, this is as good as it gets for a writer for someone who began to write the kind of, well, what would be a good idea for me to read? So I worked a little story with some other writers in Washington. They sort of liked it, some of them, and some of them didn't. And then I left the city, went away, got another job three, four, five, six years later. I take that story and I begin to build it into something else. The something else really has quotes because I didn't really know what it was about. I knew what the story was, but not the meaning. Then something happened. I was familiar with the poets, of which there are many represented on this stage and certainly in the audience. They were first. And they said powerful, interesting, complicated things. They talked about love and courage and bravery and one another. And then there was the novel. I read, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. I had not seen that kind of contemporary clarity, honesty, sentences that were more than what happened, but how, and meaning. And then there were others. There's Paul Marshall. There's Alice Walker. There were novels that were getting to come. And I took sustenance from that collection that was me as a contemporary editor at a publishing house was kind of a support system. I had never read anything quite like that. So it wasn't of those books. It was not a question of like or imitation. It was simply the door was open. The door was open. So black women writers stepped through. That's it. <laughs> and what was interesting to me is unlike contemporary African American men, powerful writing men, I mean really Ellison and Wrights and Jimmy Baldwin, et cetera, one of the things that was important to them as writers, legitimately important to them, was a confrontation with the oppressor. What was interesting about women writers is they were not interested in that. 
once you get the white man out of your book, the whole world opens up. <laughs> Truly. Once that's gone, you can begin to think about real things, not about, you know, constructed, necessary responses to some stereotype that you did not invent. The world is over here. So that seemed to me to be true very strongly among African American novel writers, and of course some poets as well. But for me, since I'm not a poet, it was important that that kind of thing existed in the novels. And I, you know, sit here listening to different voices, read words that I wrote many years ago, or even recently, giving them the meaning, even a new meaning, and a new sound. I cannot tell you how delightful that is, <laughs> to have one's words move like that through another intelligence through another creative spirit, through another tongue, and to hear it come back to you in different colors. You know, but still, you are the so-called author of it, but it no longer belongs to you. And that's the magic, <laughs> and that's the beauty. Toni Morrison is a writer of the 20th and 21st century. She came giving us a gift of words. She is, was a healer. Uh, she is an innovator. Uh, she is a woman who put African American uh, women and men uh, on a world stage that said simply, listen to what we have to say about this story in this place called America listen and learn um, that what it meant really to, in spite of what happened to us, that we remain human. That is an amazing accomplishment, you know, for a writer uh, to show us that, even though she has shown us insanity at some point. But, you know, that's part of being human in America, is that you taste insanity, you know, in the family at some point, but you keep on moving, you keep on walking, you keep on being. Toni Morrison in her novels poetically chronicles the tragic and the sublime of our American experience over 300 years. She manipulates themes and literary tropes that allow readers to see the complexity of our national story. Well, it's, it's the simple kinds of theses she has. For example, in this book, it's about love. It's a book about love. Even better than her last, most recent novel, about <laughs> love. Uh, the power of this is always uh, so moving. Uh, but it's not simply a theme or a thesis that she's developing. It's her style and her structure. Her love of language as well as of people and how language is a vehicle for exposing or exploring and examining the soul. And that's what uh, uh, I am very um, uh, awed by. And it's the use of language in a way that uh, I believe is incomparable by any other living American or African-American poet. Um, well, I call her a poetic realist because she uses language in a poetic manner. She works on different levels and on one level she is very delicate with language, as a poet would be. So I think, you know, I think as human beings, we are drawn to poetry naturally, you know. The Nicaraguans have this great saying that we're all born poets. You know, it's society that um, kind of takes that away from us, and it's our role, our job to take it back. So I think at the base of, of her writing, you know, she's a poet. And people are automatically drawn to that, you know, and they're, they're transported into different places and times and experiences. 
on another level, I mean, it's just the basis of all literature, you know, all, all art. It's about dealing with the human condition. So these are timeless stories. And on another level, you know, for oppressed people, you know, and peoples of color, and when I say oppressed peoples, they're oppressed peoples all over the world, white, black, whatever, you know. Um, it's, it's that story that we can all relate to. It's the familiar. As a critic, I love the way she creates narrative. She creates it as a puzzle almost, where you put together the pieces. And when you finish the novel, you understand that the pieces fit so well together. I enjoy her, her language because it's poetic, because it's laden with music, because it has its own unique style that leads us to understand that she has taken large themes and she has concentrated those themes in the characters of people like Sula and Seth and Nell and Eva Peace. Uh, these characters that, that ring in, in our souls. Tony's language is magical. Her, I mean, of course, her, her creation of characters uh, is amazing, but it's the language that you fall in love with first, I think. That's certainly what I fell in love with. Sula was the first Toni Morrison novel I read, and I read it over and over and over again because I, I couldn't believe the language and what she was doing with it and the, the way that she is preoccupied with relationships and uh, with um, the way that all of us um, grew up and live our adult lives missing something or having lost something, uh, her ability to use language to create characters who have experienced that kind of loss and the way she explores um, how they deal with it, how they confront it. She writes well. She, she, uh, for example, playing in the dark, which are the essays, which are brilliant. Do you know? I mean, I absolutely, they stimulated me to want to read other th people. Do you know what I mean? Uh, she writes well. She understands language. She understands how to put things together. Do you know what I mean? To, to keep the mind and the, the heart and the emotion you know, going. Spirituality is often thought of uh, as religion, but what she's dealing with is something that's not religion. It's much broader, deeper, and inclusive. She uh, taps into and um, shows to us the, the broad, uh, divine, underlying energies of the universe that are available to all of us as a resource uh, for power and for good. And she um, is able, because she had the upbringing, the experience in her own life of uh, a rich African-American culture that showed her the power of signs and ways of knowing beyond the five senses. So she's able to combine that with her craft as a novelist to present the manifestation of it in character's life so that we can understand it, find it in ourselves, and then uh, enjoy it in her work, but also use it in our own lives. It's always seemed to me that her central interest in her novels in many ways has been a kind of correction of history, a rewriting of history, uh, using fiction as a tool to engage the reader and re-educate the reader about issues that are close to her heart because she said before, I think many times actually, that she started writing these books because they weren't out there for her to read. So she wrote the books so she could read them. And of course, so uh, 
people she cared about could read them and profit from them, and those people are my students. And I always think of W.B. Du Bois when I think about her position in the firmament because uh, he was, of course, the great black historian sociologist uh, who did so much for uh, racial uplift at the turn of the century and, and then in the, the beginning of the 20th century. Since Du Bois decided to go back and rewrite the history uh, the way he saw it, and that is a classic of our historiography of black reconstruction. I see Morrison doing the same thing in her novels. And again, she's like August Wilson, another great writer uh, who decided to reinscribe history in the form of plays. He wrote 10 plays before he died, one, each one devoted to one decade of the 20th century. Uh, and all of his characters are African Americans struggling to uh, get a grip on the conditions that they've been presented with, and some of them do it triumphantly. And this is something that we see Morrison doing, too, in her novels. And I think there are almost as many novels now as there are plays by Wilson. And, but she didn't do it the way he did it. She didn't just pick arbitrarily decades. She went to historical nodes that are crucial in, in the history of uh, the race, the nation, and indeed the, the world. Toni Morrison has often lamented the fact that we're losing our folklore. It's being taken over in the culture by others. People are growing up not knowing the stories and the songs and the aspects of folklore that are so important in black culture. And she has actually said that one of her main goals as a writer in her novels is to reinforce that folklore. And she does it in such a marvelous way there's not a novel of hers that doesn't focus on many aspects of African-American folklore. No matter how many books you read on black culture, on black music, on black speech, on black rituals, on black belief, you don't get that sense that you get of the lived experience with Toni Morrison. The way she makes use of magical realism is based in folklore. It's based in what we as a people have had passed down generation to generation to generation uh, from ghosts to people willing to cut their fingers off to show you just what they'll do to people born without navels to, um, to some of these most uh, grotesque and extraordinary things. Uh, these things are the kinds of things that we might hear about on the front porches at any house in Shreveport, Louisiana, where I'm from. And so because of that, there's, a, there's, an, there's some sort of believability. There's something to us that wants to know more about that story because it hits us somewhere in our soul, somewhere in our memory, somewhere in the memory that's there before we're here. Uh, and she's very aware of folklore and, and of the history of, of our people in this country and on this planet. Morrison uses community in many ways. It is, uh, in many ways, her characters illustrate that some of their characters, some components of their character, are adopted from their communities. Uh, she uses it as a way for her characters to uh, show their differences in the world, and either to be accepted within the group or to be rejected by the group. And she shows the consequences of acceptance or the consequences of rejection. Um, she shows some people who are um, unable to fit into the community. That's always a theme that resonates with college students and with adults, too. Uh, for example, um, she shows Macon Dead Jr as a person who, while he appears to be very much in the community because he has, he has wealth and his father has status, but as an individual, he's really empty. And so we see everyone else in that community with many problems, but we finally see, uh, and this is the powerful message in that book, 
when he comes into his sense of self and his understanding of family, he also comes into community. Um, and it's interesting that, that those things don't coalesce until he finds out who he is through his ancestors. Then he can easily fit into the community. With any uh, uh, great writer, it's the specificity of the experience which can allows uh, readers to to um, to become more intimate with uh, with whatever it is they're reading. I mean, you know, James Joyce only wrote about the Irish experience in the Dubliners, uh, Stephen Dedalus, uh, and it's because of what's universal is in the specifics. And Tony's work has always been about the specificity of experiences between individuals who are part of a larger community but are distinct as persons in and of themselves. And if you can do that uh, as, a, as an artist, as a writer, uh, then that makes what, you, what you've done universal. Usually, I guess the assumption is that universal means you have to speak uh, from the general uh, and that way you encompass more, but I think the way it works is that the more you speak in a singular way, a specific way about human beings, the more it becomes something that can resonate for uh, a larger group of people, even if they're not from that experience, because emotions are universal. Tony Morrison's work helps you see a past that you haven't lived. One of the reasons that we remember the places that her fiction evokes is that she invests those places with history. So we know the histories of the people who live in a place, and that means that we kind of know that place. Um, and so many um, writers think that they have to, you know, do a, a several chapters of setting. And Morrison's work tells us we don't have to do that, that settings can be very deftly um, sketched. But if we have the histories of the people who lived in those places, we have a sense of what those places actually signify. There are so many um, taboos about women's culture that she seems to be addressing. So, for example, the very statement, the very famous uh, statement that Hannah makes when she says, I love, uh, Su I love Sula, but I don't like her. Um, I think that a statement like that in a book written by a black woman uh, demands that we pay attention to what it is that we are supposed to say about our daughters or our mothers or what we're supposed to feel about them. Uh, whether or not we're allowed to admit that there's a complexity in our relationships that for a very long time, even black women were not allowed to think about those. Is it possible to think about your mother as an imperfect being? Is it possible to think about your daughter as someone who is not like you? And so maybe her presence in your life is more troubling than gratifying. You know, uh, are we permitted to ask these hard questions and still admit that we are all worthy people? I think uh, it's difficult to, um, to convince young women who come out of, um, who, who are existing in a world that is so full of um, denial um, to say, you know, maybe there's something important about doing that kind of thinking, and then writing about it. The one thing she does, which both excites and irritates people, she dumps you right into the story. You, you open that book and you hear, you see baby Suggs, and you say, who is baby Suggs? You think you're a baby. You think there's a baby in a cradle somewhere. And suddenly you realize, after a few pages, She's talking about the grandmother, who is dead, incidentally. So it's that technique that, in which she dumps you into the story, and she says to the reader, find it. Read this and find out what, what's going on here. Don't expect me to tell you a twinkle, twinkle, little star story. 
go to it and find out what's in it. And I admire that a great deal. People, I have done a lot of that in my poetry. Uh, I don't know if it works all the time, and I don't think it works for her all the time. But it is a magnificent way of getting, first of all, what I call literary writing, writing that is mature and is not, not full of Dick and Jane sentences, and also writing that fascinates the reader and pulls the reader in if the reader is willing to be pulled. A lot of a lot of young people, a lot of older people as well, they are miffed by her work and saying, oh, it's just too difficult and this and that. But they don't understand that, you know, good writing, good um, literature requires not just, a, you know, um, a passive reading of something, a shallow reading of something, that you have to go back and it takes time. It's not like you're going to breeze through it and and think, okay, I got it, you know. You could be reading a book throughout your lifespan and always get something new. You know, it's like a, it's like a lotus. Her writing is like a lotus flower. It just continues to, you know, yield stuff and blossom. She trusts us to, to, to understand that the human experience is difficult. She trusts us to stick with her as a guide through these difficult spaces. Um, and we do, we are, we are so taken in by the story. We want to understand, okay, what led her to that funeral home? What led him to kill this woman if he loved her? Um, what, you know, who is wild and where is she? And how did, how did we get from this, this wilderness in the south to this place in Harlem and what does Harlem become? So these are questions that are resonant, resident in our bodies already when we listen to Coltrane, when we listen to think of your favorite jazz artist, whoever, fill in the blank. What does that conjure in us is a story of something that is difficult to, when we're hearing my favorite things, remixed and changed and torn apart and and it it is dizzying that's what language is i think she trusts us to stick with her through the difficulty and trust us that we will land with her in this place of our own understanding i love the fact that she doesn't tell me what to think about what she's saying we have to fall in love with what is difficult and if we can do that, then we will never deprive ourselves of someone else's genius just because it, we had to make an effort to achieve that with them. Um, so I would say that um, to include her, that you'd have to include her because I can't think of a, one other single individual writer who has brought quite the complexity of, of looking, of seeing uh, the American landscape and the African American in that landscape. I can't think of any person who has done that as copiously, as consistently, and with as much love as... Several writers and artists bear witness to the life-changing influence that Toni Morrison's challenging work has had on their own writing and their lives. I knew there were things I wanted to talk about, about race, and I still didn't know where to go for that, you know, or how to go, how to find out who could validate that for me. And, um, and The Bluest Eye came out in 1970, and uh, when I read that book, I was, uh, you know, it just felt like I had found a mother, a real, you know, uh, 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 this brave, brave woman who said, you can write whatever you need to write, you know, uh, write about these things that are hard, that are ugly, that are um, 
you know, because I really felt <clears throat> the, the greatest fear I had as a writer, this was really the greatest fear I had as a writer, is not that, not that I, the, the critics wouldn't like my work, but that black people wouldn't like my work, <laughs> that I would be shunned. That was my greatest fear. And, um, and when I read The Bluest Eye, I knew there was one person, and not only one person, but one great writer who said, do whatever the hell you need to do to tell the truth that you feel you need to tell. So that changed my life. I began to write about self-loathing uh, and about um, the complexity of color and class. Uh, and it not only made me feel like I could do this as a writer, that somebody, and as a matter of fact, she personally knew, knew me. I did send her my work, and she did write back, you know, yes, you're doing the right thing, you know. But she also helped me to understand the importance of being a mentor and of helping, of saying that to other black writers. We're, we can do anything we need to do to, um, to make great art, and great art has everything in it. I would say the impact of Dr. Morrison's work on my work is that I'm challenged now from within to be as pure with the characterizations that I'm creating as possible. And as an actor, um, to bring a certain level of honesty to the people that you're playing, regardless of how different they are, is, is mandatory now, whereas it wasn't when I was younger. And I read these characters that are created by Dr. Morrison and others, and to get the opportunity to create these people on stage, you know, there's no way in the world you can do that with half energy or with less than 150 percent commitment because these are the words and characterizations of beautiful people. I, I imagine there's, there's not an educated person not reading Toni Morrison, so you have to say there must surely be uh, crossovers, you know, that, that go back and forth, and of course Toni is incredibly well read, so you know that it it goes back, but where I have seen the input, the 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 where you actually see, as to use a Toni Morrison word, the thing. <laughs> she what is her favorite word? The stuff, is not this generation, not us, but the one behind, because now you have books of poetry, Pecola, you know, dreams of you know electric sheep or something. There, there's a a book dealing with Pecola and her dreams. That's a, a collection of poetry similar to, but not the same as Don't Misunderstand, what uh, uh, Rita Dove did with uh, her Pulitzer Prize winning um, collection of looking at those two people. So all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but I think that where you see the impact of the novelist back on the poetry, it's not with the contemporaries though, again, chronologically we're not, but artistically we are contemporaries. But you see it in the younger generation and they have read and reread and, and hailed it, and they can now hand it back in, in sculpture, they can hand it back in, in, in paintings, and certainly the poets are now handling it back poetically. Well, one of the biggest impacts that uh, I, I believe that Toni Morrison had, has had on my work and still has on my work has to be possibly the poetry and the lyricism and the imagery in, in, her, in her writing. You know, my, my first inclination was to, you know, want to be a, a fictionist, you know, a fiction writer. But for some reason, you know, uh, the muse of, 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 of poetry got me in a headlock and, you know, I became a poet. But you really can see that she is a poet. You know, her work is poetry and I think that's why so many people are drawn to it. And I think that's what sticks with, with me, that, with, that's what's in my psyche. You know, her, the sheer beauty of the language. Well, on the sentence by sentence level, I think I've really learned from her use of metaphor that part of what part of what the writer sees in his or her mind can be made more clear through a vehicle 
of something that you know the reader knows about. I mean, metaphor is as simple as saying something like, uh, this is a bad and easy metaphor, but you know the linebacker was a bear. Well, we understand just how big and ferocious the linebacker was because we are afraid of bears. That kind of thing has been really of use to me, but also what in fiction they call uh, ma magical realism, and in poetry what we just simply call the, the surreal, the ability to see a thing, see a person, and to allow it, the supernatural that we know exists in this natural world. Uh, that seems to me uh, two of the most wonderful things about her writing that I, that I try to emulate in my own work. The art of teaching Toni Morrison's work comes in creating a learning environment that explores both the exterior and interior spaces of human experience and suspends easy assumptions in understanding them. In her very first novel, The Blue Side 1973, that first sentence, quiet as it's kept, there were no marigolds in the fall of 1941. Okay, a simple sentence like that, and then she goes on to say, and we thought it was because Piccola was having her father's baby. But say that, take that first sentence, you have the marigolds, uh, and, and you have all the connotations of fall, of 1941, war, and all of the rest of that. But see, she's immediately almost invoked the whole universe, the whole cosmos. And see that kind of invoking of the whole cosmos, the universe of energies. It's just there from the very beginning in everything that she does. And I think it, it gives it weight, it gives it credence. I think if I could analyze why it works, then it wouldn't work. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can you can take something apart and say, okay, this is how, and look how she uses this word, or look how she moves from, from a, a, a pure description and engages all the senses, and then just slips into the action. That's the how, but that's not the why. The why is really the magic, and it's the mystery of every great of every great writer. I think that in the end, there's something that still knocks you breathless. You go, whoa, every time you read it, because, uh, you know, I, I, I can read her over and over again and still be knocked breathless. And I had such a ball trying to, you know, pick a, pick a passage because I was just reading books over and over again that gave me a chance to do that. But, um, but I do think that, that one of the things that has been really wonderful um, in her work that has in terms of teaching other writers, is uh, to show by that example how very specific you can get into someone's um, interior life who has nothing to do with you, according to all the stats. I mean, who doesn't look like you, who isn't your gender, who doesn't come in the same class or anything like that, and yet, and yet you feel in any of Tony's works that you are right inside of their head, looking out, feeling this stuff. And I have seen it happen with very privileged, preppy, young white boys, you know, reading, reading this in a class. And I've seen it, you know, happen with people from other countries. It's, it's something there, but that's part of the magic. It really, and I do think there's a bit of magic in there. Yeah. As a theater professor, I would introduce Dr. Morrison's work um, for the purposes of introducing a world to students that not many have ever entered or thought about in a tangible sort of way. Uh, I used to tease my students here at Virginia Tech uh, that, and that at the beginning of the semester, I, I shared with them that by the time they left me at the end of that semester, they will have climbed into the feet of a Latino or a Latina, an African American, a Native American, and I shared with them that I wasn't able to explore an African American voice in theater until eighth grade. And, 
everything I read, everything that was taught to me was done from an Anglo perspective. And so I felt like my job while teaching was to open those windows for these students. And uh, it was magical um, to watch these kids allow themselves to be opened up that way. And uh, playing African-American women in the short scenes that we did and playing Latinas and playing um, you know, Chinese characters, uh, it forces you to look at yourself and look at others and figure out where, where and how that void can be, can be compacted. Tony Morrison's work for, for, I think, in teaching it introduced the students to things that they would, to, to assumptions that they have, but she uh, undermines or subverts those assumptions. And so for me, that was always um, the value, that, you know, of teaching Tony's work, is that she overturns all of the convenient assumptions that, that, uh, that students would come to her work with. I think her work lets the reader find themselves, locate themselves, locate their heads. And that's an elementary textbook into who am I?